So we're going to be handing out uh, USB keys to everybody that has the VM images. Uh, Madhu, do we we have about 70 of these left? Or yeah. Yeah, actually, if you need if you need a USB key, you don't have the images. Raise your hand, maybe, and we'll pass them out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then once you, I, actually, it looks like a lot of people already have them, but we'll we'll pass them out here. We'll get them around. There we go. <laughs> He's tossing them. So we'll kind of wait till everyone gets gets a USB key here, and then we'll get started on this as well. There's a couple of seats up front here. If people, if 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 anyone wants to come and sit down up front. You don't have to be shy. Ryan doesn't bite. He's okay. <laughs> you never know. Okay. Okay, so we'll kind of get we'll kind of get started here. This, I I usually like to wander around when I talk, so this is going to be difficult for me to just stand here, I guess, a little bit. But um, so welcome uh, to the second. Oh. Ah, uh, this is better. Okay, so welcome to day two of the Open Daylight Summit. I, it's kind of interesting that they they put this tutorial right away in the morning on the second day after the party last night. So, um, but this will be pretty good. So hopefully everyone's here to learn about using OpenStack with Open Daylight. So we've the the team of people that have been working on this uh, have been working on this for quite a while now. Um, so hopefully hopefully everyone gets a good idea of this. Uh, I just put four of the names of the people that are going to be helping out as we're going through this. These three, these three people will be doing that. So actually, uh, Ryan, could you raise your hand so everyone sees you? Uh, Brent and Madhu, you guys are at the back, right? Raise your hand. So, so if, we need, if people need help as we're going through this, these guys are going to kind of wander through and we'll be able to assist people uh, with things as well. So, um, okay, let's see. Let's jump into things here. Okay, so what what I, this is kind of what I hope everyone walks away with from this presentation as well afterwards. Um, so actually, first of all, a show of hands. How many people have experience with open daylight? How many people have brought up open daylight a little bit? Okay, so that's that's not bad. Um, how many people who raised their hands brought it up yesterday during a tutorial for the first time? Okay, so there's. Not a lot of experience there. Okay, what about OpenStack? Does anyone have, a, how many people have experience with OpenStack? Okay, so there's, there's a good experience. So this, this tutorial will be somewhat, somewhat uh, high level, I think, depending upon, but you can go deeper if you want as well. So we're gonna give everyone experience bringing up OpenStack, uh, Open Daylight on Fedora, Linux as well. Uh, that's what the VMs that are on the USB keys have as well. Um, we're also gonna give people experience bringing up a multi-node OpenStack environment using DevStack. Um, and then, hopefully, you get some experience seeing how the two of them uh, integrate together and how Open Daylight is able to orchestrate virtual networks for OpenStack Neutron as well. Okay. So really, this is, I mean, really, this is as simple as, it's, as it gets right now. We're going to have two VMs. One of the VMs that you're going to use will have Open Daylight running in it as well as the OpenStack control software and OpenStack Compute, Nova Compute on it. And the second VM will just be uh, running Nova Compute as well. And this way we'll be able to see uh, you know, the tunnel network set up for the tenants and everything like that. So, okay, everyone has the USB key? So let's plug them into your machines and copy the, copy the files over. The other thing you're gonna need is either VirtualBox or Fusion or Workstation or KVM or something like that. There'll be two folders in that uh, stick. Uh, this, this tutorial is for on the dev stack only. That's a good point. You can hold on to that one. I'll stay up here. Okay. 
So I'm going to try to do this as low. Interesting. Ah, there we go. That, that worked. OK. So I've actually already copied these over. Um, so we'll go through this kind of slow to make sure that everyone gets that. Um, I'm going to boot the compute or the control instance first that I have here. So this will boot relatively quick here. So everyone else, uh, is everyone else booting their, their control instances as well? Yeah? OK. So this is now, this is up, going to log in as the login information for this, by the way. The username is ODL, and the password is ODL as well. And it, it is set up for, for sudo access as well. So I'm just going to take a look. So in my case, yeah, this, this one was already configured as well. Okay. So, so how many people have their control instances booted up already? No one? A couple people? Okay. How many people are still copying the images off of the USB keys? There's a lot. Of, okay. Uh, login is ODL, and ODL is the password as well. Just a sec. Let me bring up the slide. I think there's... Yeah. I'll leave that up for a sec. So there's... That's actually... Wait a sec. That's actually incorrect. Uh, and for those who have... Uh Double copying the image over. Uh, the USB has been formatted with XFAT, so you have to install that driver. Uh, for which which operating systems? I mean, uh, XP doesn't support it. Yesterday we saw that, and he has problem with Ubuntu now. So. Yeah. Oh, Ubuntu had a problem as well with. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if, any, if anyone's having trouble or anything, raise your hand as well, and we'll get someone over. Hey, Brent, could you? Ah, got it. Thanks. OK, so maybe while we're waiting for everyone to copy the images and bring up the control node, um, let me go back to these slides over here as well. So lo logistically, um, where is this right here? I'm, I can't wander around now. Th this is this is a high-level slide of what you're going to have to change on the open daylight slide um, image as well. So as you can see here, um, we've put open daylight in the image as well, and it's the released virtualization edition uh, of hydrogen as well. Inside the ODL directory, there's there's an open there's an ODL directory and then an open daylight. And inside there, there's a configuration directory, and there's a config.ini file as well. Okay, that's a little. It's on. Okay, so one of the one of the configuration items that you're going to want to deal with is the the OVSDB support that's in Open Daylight supports both OpenFlow 1.0 and OpenFlow 1.3, and I. Think I think that this was discussed yesterday at one of the sessions, although Madhu will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, did you discuss the diff a little? Okay. I mean, at, at a high level, the differences are OpenFlow 1.0 uh, will set things up to look exactly like the Open vSwitch Neutron plugin um, or the ML2 Open vSwitch mechanism driver as well, where you will have two bridges on the host, uh, a BR int and a BR tunnel, and you'll have patch ports between the two and things like that. OpenFlow 1.3 does things a little bit more intelligently. It uses a single bridge, and it uses multiple tables on the bridge to handle the tunnel traffic. So that's, that's a configurable option uh, in there as well. Um, and then there's also, you can configure an IP address if you have like a multi-homed host as well. You can set that up in there, so Open Daylight will bind to a specific interface as well. It should, if you log in as ODL, uh, there should be an ODL directory, I think. And then in there is, or is it, do an L, hold on a sec, I'll do this. Did you find it? Ah. Actually here. If you see here, so there, I'm logged in as ODL, so there's actually an ODL directory in there. I think this should be pretty readable. So inside Open Daylight, that's the, the unzipped uh, hey Kyle, released version. Yeah. How do you increase the font? Uh, yeah, actually, hold on, I'm going to actually do this.
There it is. That's that's a little better, Madhu. Yeah. Yeah. Seems okay. Uh, wait a sec. I just need to see what that IP address is. I'll log in from over here. There we go. One thirty-three. Yeah, yeah. There. Okay. This should be a little. This should be a little bit more readable. Okay. So you can see in this directory here where the open daylight would be untarred if you if you download or unzipped if you if you have it there. There's the configuration, and then there's a config.ini file. So inside of this, this is where you'll see the the version. So it defaults to OpenFlow 1.0, uh, the OVSDB support inside of Open Daylight. Um, you can uncomment this to do 1.3. I I think that uh, this is actually uncommented by default. I think is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for verifying. So, so then um, th there's a run.sh lowercase script here as well, which actually is what is used to start Open Daylight. I've actually created a capital run.sh that actually has both versions uh, as far as the command line parameters to start this. I think that this should be, con you, you want to make sure that this OpenFlow 1.3 is, is uncommented. Yeah. Did you have something to do or no? No. Okay. So as long, once you do that, then we can go ahead and bring up Open Daylight by, by running this. And so then we'll let this, this will spin for a second as it boots up. So just a show of hands, how many, how many people are, are at this point as well? Is anyone here or are people still copying things over or, or bringing up VMs? Okay. Few people. One, yeah, one one dot three. Leave that one uncommented. Yeah, yeah. And then make sure you also have in the configuration config dot i and i the one dot three uncommented as well. Yeah. You you can change those. Um, I think Madhu was saying that by default it's fine to leave it on and let it bind everything at this point. Yeah. Otherwise you could set it up to be the second interface. So the way that the VMs are set up, um, depending upon if you're using VirtualBox, Fusion, or Workstation, the first interface on the VMs is typically going to be the NAT interface, so it'll be NATed. And then the second one is set up as a private network on the host. So typically that's what, that's what we'll use for this communication, but, but either, either way it'll work. Uh, just in case, right, for VirtualBox, we had some problems yesterday when we were running this demo. Okay. So try to avoid NAT as your any communication for it, right? So just use... Uh, if you can create two uh, host-friendly networks on a virtual box and use only host-friendly networks for, for this. Yeah. Don't use NAT. Don't use NAT. Don't use so NAT. if you're using virtual box, don't use NAT. And you create them under preferences in the global config, not in the actual VM itself, just in case anybody's fresh to virtual box. That, that's for virtual box, Brent? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. We learned painfully yesterday. You learned painfully. Uh, hey, do you, do you guys know the, the the simple forwarding bundle is out of this, right? We right. Okay, good. We'll so we don't do that. Yeah. Okay, so this so once this is up, it should be running again. So we can look at the bundles that are running by doing an lb command. We can look for the ovsdb bundles as well, and you should see three of them: the ovsdb, the neutron one, and then the northbound uh, API one as well. So, has has anyone made it to this point yet for the tutorial? A few people. Does anyone need help uh, or is stuck at anything at this point? If, if anyone's stuck, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get someone over to help. Okay. Uh, can some, yeah. Actually, just for my own curiosity, how many people are using VirtualBox? Uh, how many people are using Fusion or Workstation? Anyone? Just a couple? Okay. Madhu, stop laughing. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's see if we get. We'll wait a sec to see if, any, if other people come up to this point. I'm going to log in over. Uh, I'm going to increase the font size here as well, just a sec.
For folks that are trying to do VirtualBox under Windows, you, you may run into some fun issues with uh, the amount of memory that this thing wants, as well as uh, VirtualBox not wanting to let you at the host-only interfaces. So you might have to play around with it a little bit. Did you figure that out here, or you're still? still struggling with it? Okay. So Ryan will update for people running Windows with VirtualBox. I work around here. Actually, I should note too that that these VMs do require a fair fair bit of memory as well. Um, so if you have eight gig of RAM on your laptop, you and eight gig or higher, you should be okay with booting these. But if you got four, yeah, it's not going to work because. Well. The fact that we're running all of the OpenStack control software as well as Open Daylight in the single VM, yeah, 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 it's it's fairly memory intensive at that point, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh. Log into the VM? Okay, let me log in here. Okay. Did you want to uh, to see the... Gotcha, okay. So, so the way that we got from here logging in to here having open daylight running in the VM, so we went into the ODL directory, and then if you do an LS in there, there's an open daylight directory as well. So then we're gonna go into the open daylight directory, and if you do an LS to look at the files, you'll see a configuration directory. I don't, I don't think that anyone should have to modify these files. I was kind of showing in an example. They should be set up for OpenFlow 1.3, and they should be set up to bind all the interfaces on the host, so that should be okay. But it, the only thing I'm not sure about is this capital run.sh script. You may have to uncomment the 1.3 and comment the bottom one out. I think it may be reversed. Just make sure that that's set up that way. Yeah, this is very important. If, yes. you, if you don't have this one, then nothing's going to work for you guys. Right. So, yeah. Because you, you have to either go all 1.0 or all 1.3. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we'll see, we'll wait a sec here to see where people are at with that. So how many people have, have the, the controller up and running in their VM now? A few people? There's a couple people that have it up and running, okay. Uh, just, just to note to all of you here, see, right? I mean, not everybody made get it working today. <laughs> because that's the reality of DevStack. We have spent weeks to get it working. So don't feel bad if it doesn't work. Now just uh, look at the video that's being recorded and you know, go through this uh, tutorial later point of time and get it working. So yeah, and I think the other thing to note is is that I mean, if, this should work if your la you know if your laptop has eight gig of RAM, but but people may hit memory issues with this as well. And and though outside of the scope of this presentation to some extent, although if we have time we could do it, you know, we, we could like natively run open daylight on your laptop itself if we had to to remove uh, some of the requirements on that VM uh, as well. The only requirement there would be you'd need Java on, on your laptop as well, to, the, the JDK, right? Uh, JRE is fine. JRE, yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to start talking through the OpenStack configuration on this as well. So while people are continuing to bring up their controllers, and we'll, we'll go through this slowly, and we can always back up to it as well when people get there. So in the same directory, you'll notice that, that there's a DevStack directory. So that's, that's where the OpenStack uh, DevStack project is checked out in here. And we have it set up, so we have the, the version that supports Open Daylight. That's not, it's not upstream yet, it's under review at this point to go into uh, the Ice House release of OpenStack, but, but this is, it has the version checked out that has support for that, and same with the Neutron ML2 mechanism driver as well. Um, so if we go, uh, the other thing is, you'll notice there's two local 
.comp files. There's a compute one and a control node one there. So those, and, and I, it, it's pretty obvious what those are, right? One of those is set up for your comp, uh, compute node and one is for your control node. The, the compute node one will only run um, Nova Compute and the VNC proxy. Uh, the control node one will run all of the OpenStack control software. So if we go into the dev stack directory, you can actually copy the um, the local.conf. I'm not going to do that because this is actually set up, but but you can copy it, the, the control one over into this directory as just local.conf, C-O-N-F. And inside this, I'll just quickly walk through this. I mean, how many people have used DevStack before at all to, to pull an OpenStack image? So there's a handful of people out here as well. So, I mean, this marginally probably looks esoteric to some people as well. So I'll just kind of highlight some things in here at this point. Specifically, specifically at the top, um, this has undergone some, some slight changes. This used to be a local RC file, but the upstream folks have changed this, so it's a local.conf, which makes it more flexible because it allows configuration of multiple files uh, in the OpenStack setup as well. So if you look at the top, the key things here are we have offline equals true uncommented, which means that this assumes that it's offline. It's not going to try to pull any new code down or anything like that. And we have reclone equals yes commented out. That, that'll also signify it's not going to do any sort of git pull into your OpenStack directories as well. The other thing that's, that's worth looking at here is these are the services that we're specifically enabling and disabling. Um, I should note that we're, we're disabling Rabbit, uh, RabbitMQ because on Fedora, uh, Cupid is the, is the messaging daemon that's used instead. So some things that you may have to change on this as well, and I think that this is in the example file. The host IP, so this is the IP address uh, typically of the ETH1 interface on your host, the host only interface that you want. So that's the IP address you're gonna wanna put for this host IP here as well. So if we look, uh, I'm just gonna stop this. So typically like in my configuration you can see, you can see right here the IP address. That's on ETH1, so that's typically the, the IP address that you'd want to use as well. Like I said, on the host-only interface. And as Madhu had mentioned, you know, stay away from the NAT interfaces on VirtualBox if, for issues. So some other things worth noting here are, uh, let's see, you'll want to change this VNC proxy client address as well to the same IP address that's used for the host IP address. Um, this host name, this should be set up correctly. Um, the service host is also the same IP address that's on ETH1 as well. And I th think that the only other thing to change is at the bottom under this ML2 ODL section near the bottom. Again, this IP address, will, you'll want this to be the same as, as ETH1. So the, the example configuration file that's there should have these sections set up so that it's, it's obvious you have to change them. I think that 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 was the case, right? We Okay. So we can walk through this as well because um, I know some folks are still working on bringing up the, the controller as well. So maybe while we're doing that, I'll go ahead and fire up my control node dev stack right now. So once, once you have that file set up correctly and everything, then it's as easy as being in the dev stack directory and just running stack.sh, which will likely take somewhere between a minute to you know one to two to three minutes. And that'll go ahead and, and fire up all of the OpenStack control services on this as well. Um, so if, for folks who have never run dev stack before, uh, on the Neutron side, it's going to create two networks by default. It's going to create a public network and a private network. Um, the private network is for the tenants and the public one assumes that it you know, that that's bridged to a physical interface somewhere to get out, and that's where your floating IP addresses would be assigned. Um, so that's what this configuration will do when it's done. So let's see, now a show of hands. How many people have the controller up now? More people, yeah, uh, there a few more? Yeah, there's a few more. Hey, Kyle, yes. there's one person here having problem with uh, VMware Fusion. Okay. Uh, so what is the problem? It says uh, import fails because... Um, do, does it give you the option to retry, does it say? Oh yeah, click the retry. That's a good point, actually. Um, with VMware Fusion, it may fail the OVA import. Oh, it worked? Yeah, 
It'll, it'll say something about incompatibility, but it'll give you the option to retry. If you click retry, then it'll work out okay. Okay, so this is, this is moving along pretty fast. Uh, there's one more thing, right? Give, give enough time between starting Open Daylight Controller and the OpenStack Controller. No, if, if you do it so quickly, right, we have some issues with the timing, right? So oh, yeah, right. And, and typically, right, we'll get the Open Daylight Controller up first, and then we'll... Yeah, uh, op start, start it first, wait for a few minutes, and then yeah. start the OD. Yeah, that's a good point. So this is actually almost almost done running at this point. Ah, yes. Question? Do I have questions on this one? Exactly, yep. And I can walk you here, let me log back in in another window and I can show you. I can walk you through the uh, all the different places as well. Although if you if you copied the local dot conf dot control from the home directory of the ODL user, I think it it's it's um it should be highlighted in there, right? Where you need to change it with there's, a, there's a tag saying yeah. IP address of the control IP address. Yeah. Or, yeah, I'll show you that actually right now. Uh, oh yeah, this one doesn't. Yeah, this is a slightly earlier version of the image, but. <laughs> it doesn't have that change. That's the yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. it'll be evident if you open the local conf dot control, you will see an um, ugly tag saying IP address of the yes. open stack controller. Oops. Let's see. Where is the final destination? It's in the root. The, you, yep. If you just log in as ODL, it'll be right in the home, right? Right in the home directory of the ODL user. Correct. And then you'll just want to copy that into the uh, dev stack directory. You'll want to copy it just as local.conf without the dot com, uh, control extension. Can you do another SSH? Open another SSH. Okay, we'll pop back over here. So this is, so this is still running. Actually, it uh, it should be uh, complete here in just a second as well. Yes. Okay. Ah. So, so you'll if you do uh, if you look at your ETH one interface, that would be what the one that you'd want to use for that. Are you using VirtualBox or Fusion or? Okay. Did did you? Yes. Which word? Yeah, this is still running over here. Yeah, whichever address is your non NAND. Yeah, that's fine. Use control point. You also copy the control. It begins I forgot to mention, once we get this running, we'll see whose laptop fan is the loudest for having all this running as VMs. So, Okay, there we go. So, so this one completed. When, it's, when uh, the dev stack is done running, you'll see um, stack.sh completed at the bottom uh, after, after all of this uh, information as well. So has anyone, has anyone made it this far? No? A couple, one person? Okay. A couple people over there. Is anyone stuck with anything at this point? We can come by and help people out. Yes. Congratulate them for making it work so far. Yeah, exactly. Congratulations to the two gentlemen who have actually made it this far, so as well. Nice work. So okay. So now um, once you get it once you get it this far, actually. The next thing we can do here is, and I'll just walk through this here. I'll bring up a web browser, okay. and we'll just go to the IP address. Hey, I just one uh, yes. controller. If you look at the console, there'll be a lot of exceptions. Just ignore it for now. The, the OSGI console. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Actually, that's a good point. I should yeah. show that. Yeah. Just ignore it. Don't. So once. Very much. And maybe 
You want to show the SS? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Want, uh, you SS? SS OBS DB. And do a DM, DM of on five? the 142. 142. Yeah. So if you look at it here, right, um, you should be able to see the... Oh, shit. Scroll up a little? No, no, no. Oh. No, this is right there. Yeah, right there. The cursor right there. Okay. The binding of our broker, it should be available, required available, right? Um, that yeah, that's, that's critical, right? That means working, yeah. yeah. So even though the exceptions, just ignore them. This is the most important one. SS OBS DB and DM on the... Uh, right. So again, we, do S we did the SS OBS DB to see all of the bundles, right? Yeah, and, and do a DM neutron, the 142. 142 is the neutron's uh, number here, right? Here, right? Uh, you have to make sure everything is re registered. If it's unregistered, that means it's screwed up. Sorry. And then you're looking for the binding aware broker there. Yeah. Yep. So the other thing you can do is we could look at print nodes, right? And we could see the nodes that are registered, right? Well. Maybe not. Okay. It's fine, but the, the, the guaranteed one is to make sure everything is re registered there. Okay. It's not been registered there. Okay, so, so in the meantime, we went to the IP address that we had for ETH1 here as well. We got the Horizon uh, GUI, so we'll log into that. Running. What's the next thing? You got the dev stack running? No. So, so this will be your, your OpenStack instances up and running in that yeah. Fedora VM as well. It's going to be a little bit slow logging in the first time, but... Hey, uh, Kyle, is it possible to upload the PPT somewhere so that folks can download and start using? Since we are going ahead, right? Yeah. There are a few guys who are lagging behind. They, they are going back to the how to start the stack. Actually, that's a good point. We could copy them to USB. Should I do it now? I do it from there. Yeah, yeah. From your laptop. Put it on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Twitter is a good idea. Yeah, yeah, we could do that, actually. Hold on. Um, you want to copy it to the Open Daylight Wiki? You can do that. You want to do it? Yeah, yeah. I don't have the, oh, it's the same one. Well, I think I emailed them to you, right? Same one. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much the same one. Yeah, there was, yeah, there wasn't much change. Yeah, you want to do that? Yeah. Okay, okay. So this is the, so so we're logged into the to the uh, Horizon uh, GUI, uh, GUI here. The other thing I wanted to mention was in another tab, I'll bring up the the Open Daylight uh, GUI as well. Uh, this is actually Ice House. Yeah. So this because the reason for that is. Um, we're working to get this ML2 mechanism driver into IceHouse as well, so so this will all be IceHouse and likely IceHouse from last week. So everyone will be running uh, effectively the, the tip of the trunk at this point. Why do you need ML2 if uh, OpenDaylight That's actually a good question, right? So the question was, why do we need ML2 with OpenDaylight? And and it is just a a pass through plugin as well. The the thing is, uh, one of the things. And I actually, you know, maybe a plug for my talk. I gave a talk on ML2 with Bob Kakura from Red Hat in, at Hong Kong. So one of the things that ML2 does is it removes the need for the plugin writer to deal with things like segmentation management, database management, and all these other things. The ML2 mechanism driver for Open Daylight is, is, is only about 250 lines of code, actually. If we were to do that as our own plugin, you know, that would be probably four to five times as big because we'd have to duplicate all of the database code and all of that. So while conceptually it might, you might think, well, why do we need that? It actually ends up uh, making a lot of sense from a code point of view and everything like that. Yes, yeah. Uh, now wait a sec, why did this not, oh, oh, sorry, wrong. Mental note, always make sure you use the right IP address. There we go, look at that. Okay, so we can log in uh, using admin and admin here as well. Now this, I can't quite, uh, hey Madhu, do you know how? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know this problem, particular problem is me? Like do we can't, uh, I can't uh, just, uh, How do I, without, do I do? I mean, uh, yeah. how do I do that with just this? Oh, there we go, <laughs> whoops. There it is, got it, yeah. figured it out, okay. So. Uh, the reason it's not connected is we have LCT issues, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly what we are seeing there. Uh, LCT is not decoded properly, you know, it's more not to. So you won't see the connections there, but it's not to the connections. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this this is the this is the Open Daylight GUI. Um, if any, oh, uh, admin and admin, yes. If anyone has questions on these particular things, I'll let Madhu handle the, the answer to those or, or Brent, wherever. 
Okay, so so now now what we'll do is we've got we've got the open daylight uh, controller up. We've also got the control node for OpenStack up. Um, those those are actually talking. So actually, if we look, so one thing we'll do before we bring up the second compute node is <clears throat> let me show you this as well. So we'll go back to the to the host that we're on. <coughs> We'll take a look at the, the OVS configuration now. We're using, let me just move this up to the top so it's easier to see. So we're doing pseudo OVS VS kettle show. So we'll, t we'll take a look at that. So what you can see now is, um, I think that that BR ton is actually from a previous run. I should actually get rid of that. So ignore that for now. The BR int is what's, is what's important here. And you can see on the BR int, um, it's connected through that controller, that controller line right there. It's connected over to to Open Daylight. I should also make mention that so, so uh, the manager is connected as well. This is the OVS DB connection, which is connected up to Open Daylight as well. Uh, on the BR int here, specifically, you can see a tap interface here. This tap interface is for the DHCP port that's created. Um, by Neutron when it's creating the, the private network as well. And then you can also see here, um, actually, this must be from a previous run because I haven't booted this yet. This is kind of confusing. Well, this should show up once I boot the other node. Okay, that's mildly confusing and I apologize for that. Okay, so let's, let me boot up the second compute node now. Share it on the screen. Yeah. I'll bring it up in my uh, browser here. How about? Uh, green bar can be there. I could just. What's the link? Wiki.openDataTalk.org/slash/images/3/32. Yeah. Oh, what if I just go here? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Images. Slash three. Slash thirty-two slash capital O open slash underscore ODL underscore OVS DB dot PPT. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. That should be the link. So if people want to download the slides locally, which has a lot of the information that we've covered, uh, maybe that's. We enter for instruction. Yeah, we'll just make sure that this actually starts pulling it down. HTTPS. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. PPTX or just PPT? Oh. PPT, huh? You can stop it and retype it. Yeah. It works? It works. Okay. Someone got it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, someone was able to get it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Try it again if you want. I'm just going to see it. Wiki dot open. Images slash 332. Is that ODL OVSDB? Yeah, ODL underscore OVSDB. <laughs> Weird. Okay, it's not working for me, but, that's, but, the, that's, but that's the URL. I'm glad it's working for other people, though. Okay, does how many people now have the controller up at least? Does anyone else have a good number of people? A few? Okay. Anyone else have the, the control node OpenStack infrastructure up as well? Oh, a few other people, okay. Okay, who cheated and went ahead and has the compute node up? No one? Okay, just checking. Okay, so I, I booted this, so I booted a second VM with this, and the, the way you can do this is, you can clone this, I think, right, Madhu? That's probably the easiest way, is to clone the first one, and then, and then boot it up. It's going to get, it'll get a sec, uh, different IP address for ETH1, and then you can just 
We'll walk through that as well, uh, how to configure that. So what I'll do, I'm just going to log in here to verify what IP address I have here. Access denied. Yeah. Oh, I can. Yes. Okay. Thirty-four. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I see some rabbit configuration there. What? Rabbit. It shouldn't be right. It's commented out, disabled, right? I see. I saw rabbit in LFC. So for password, I just I just enter all. Okay, hold on. Yeah, I mean, can, so, can you uh, mind, shall I? Have you run this again? I'm going to log in here. So one, one thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run this again. I'm actually going to redo this live in front of all of you. I wanted to, I, one thing I didn't do was clean up, the, um, clean up the, the OVS bridges in this from when we were setting all this up the other day. So I'm going to make sure that I have, that this is all cleaned up. I'm going to make sure this tunnel is deleted. Okay. So I'm just going to restart this stack as well. Let's see what's over here. Okay, nothing's connected. Okay. So I'll let this run in the background. Okay, so now... Okay, now, now I'm logged into my second compute node over here. So... Since you cloned this, it's going to be exactly the same. This is going to have open daylight as well as uh, dev stack on it. But you don't want to run open daylight on this. This you just want to run the compute node on. So, so we'll go into the dev stack directory. You, you would want to copy the, I'll take a look at this here, local.conf.compute. <clears throat> so this is the one you'd want, to, you'd want to copy into there. If we look at, if we look at what this is, Everywhere. This one will be subtly different because you'll need the IP address for both your control node, ETH1, as well as the compute node, ETH1. How about this one? This one? So this should be set up with, with the host name of this VM. I think we just defaulted it to Fedora ODL2. Yeah. Um, the host IP will be here. This is the, the compute host's IP address. So in this case, it's 134 for mine. Yours will be different depending upon whatever your private network is and what IP addresses were given out by either VirtualBox or Workstation or Fusion. Um, service, the service host right here, service host name is, is, is going to be one there. The service host IP is your control node's IP again, not the compute node. So make sure that that's set up correctly as well. The VNC proxy client address will be the local compute node's proxy client address. Um, <coughs> And then the only other, the only other thing is you can change the the ML2 configuration down here to match the control nodes IP address as well. Okay, so I I restacked over here, so we'll let that. I don't have to wait for that to finish actually. So now on the con, on the compute node, I'm going to go ahead and stack this. The compute node one will actually finish in about 20 seconds because it because it's really only starting up Nova Compute, so this one will go really fast, actually. So again, if, anyone, if anyone's having trouble or has questions, you know, raise your hand and we'll have people come by and, and help you out bringing up uh, either op the Open Daylight stuff or the OpenStack stuff as well. Uh oh, failed. Oh, look at that. We can debug an actual failure here. Let's see. So it looks like in this case, my. Uh, <clears throat> oh, did I actually. Should we the IP address again? Yeah. No, no, no. I think this actually crashed OVS vSwitch D. Click and clone. Being the stupid VM, I don't even know. I just want to. Just... And, and the thing is, then okay, so I cleaned it up. Let me restack. So I don't make it the VMDK anymore just to scratch it. Right. You can export it as VM. It, it should have been because it's the same image as the first one. Can you import this appearance? 
Yeah, that's what I was trying to do, but then unfortunately the event didn't go to the touchline. So I, I guess I should note as well that, that these, these images are using Fedora 20, and as a result, they're also using Open vSwitch 2.0, which is one of the more recent versions of Open vSwitch as well. So, okay, that time it worked. So, so now, okay, it's connected as well. Um, this one is connected as well. Okay, yeah, this makes more. This, th this is actually better now. So this is on the control node again. You can see that um, brint and brex are created here. And then on the com on the compute node, uh, I don't see. Oh, it's not created yet. Okay, let's go back over to the GUI here as well. So now, now, now on the OpenStack GUI, we should see once this loads here. Oh, uh, where's Madhu? Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. So as far as the BR int on the hosts. We, we create that, we don't create that right away by default, Open Daylight does. Once it gets connected, it creates it when you're, when we first do an operation down there, right? Okay, BR int, uh, it's automatically created by the dev stack when it comes up, but if it fails, the Open Daylight creates it. So we create it if it is missing already. So, so by default, when the uh, dev stack connects to the controller, when, when the uh, node connects to the con Open Daylight controller, yeah. after that, it should be there. If not, there's an issue, there's a bug. Oh. Mostly the bug is the OF13 and uh, it's not, OF1.3 is not coming up or things like that. Okay. Either the OVSDB is not fully up. You know, the, the, the one we discussed, SS OSDB and the unregistered one, that should be the most likely issue. So maybe we have this issue. <laughs> so in my case, my, uh, I didn't get it. Oh, you also, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, going on. Do you get in OJ? Yeah. Um, oh, I see them both connected. Oh, it is in, uh, it's in dev stack, right? It's, it's in the compute? Yeah, yeah. Oh, can I do a uh, print notes again, if you don't mind? Oh, well, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Hmm. So 134 is the new thing, right? 134 is a compute node? Uh, yes, yes. So I don't know why it didn't. Um, it uh, can, can, you do, can you do a Dell manager and do it, manage it again? OVS, VSCTL Dell manager. Yeah, 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 we'll do that. Or the really end stack, that will work. <laughs> uh, set manager, set manager. Ah, uh, that's right. Hmm, that's the reason. Do a TCP there. Oh. TCP column, but uh, that's not the issue right now, but let's see. Hmm. <coughs> Connected, okay. This area, right? Uh, stats, it's a stats issue. It's not a uh, OVSDB stuff. Okay, ho hold on. Uh, I'll be right there. Right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, underscore ODL underscore OVSDB PPT. No, cap small. It's interesting. <coughs> underscore OVSDB PPT. OVSDB PPT, yeah. What is that? Yeah. Welcome back. Okay, that's. Wow, well, it's, it's a real demo, right? So. That's this is the reality, guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I... <coughs> no, this is the exception in the. This is not wrong. This is not wrong. So maybe it's up here. Can you scroll? Scroll. Keep going. Should restart. Uh, delete the connection. Restart it. Maybe it'll trigger a message. No, the, if you do uh, unstack again, you don't have it. Sure. You can do, uh, uh, do unstack. Again. Yeah. Then we'll restack. Do a really unstack. That's it. That's it. Oh. Uh, yeah. 
Good day, good day, my friends. That should have done. Okay, let's stay over here. Let's see what we get over here. Yeah, it's supposed to get it. Do a pinball tournament. Yeah, yeah. It's the only one movie is done, right? Yeah, that's good. Yep, yep. Wait, what happened? Oh, it's still going. Oh. Oh, there's the there's the hat here. Oh, session's gonna take me here now. Session's gonna take me session. Pinballs. Huh. Two of these, yeah. Yeah. Can you go back there? Thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You know, you start controller. You can restack everything. Oh, only, 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 only the computer mode, right? Yeah, it's only like 950. Uh, well, because the controller is working. Wait, okay. but if I kill the controller, I have to redo the. Don't need the controller. The controller you need to repair. Oh, but I've done. Okay. Oh, you mean you want me to completely wipe this out? Yeah, how about this? Yeah. So we're working through some technical difficulties with the demo right now. <laughs> Uh, RC, local RC. Yeah. Okay, so that's actually a good point. A gentleman at the front ran into an issue where if you if you kill, maybe you hit control C or something, or it, exactly. If, if, if you end up with a local RC that's halfway generated and is maybe empty and you run stack.sh, you'll get a message saying, you know, I found both local RC and local.conf. So you can actually unstack, delete the local RC, and then you rerun it and it should be good. Yeah. There's some live design going on here. There's some what? Live design. I never yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, got it. For those curious, we're now live debugging this problem. Thanks, Madhu. Actually, that's a good point that Thomas just brought up. So this this session's actually two hours, so so if everyone can hang with us. We we still have another hour to go. Or, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll get there. That's why we'll take a little second to look at this problem before redoing things. Okay, so I'm just going to re 
Due to the unknown nature of this particular issue, we're going to restart real quick. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to redo, I'm just going to restart my controller and my OpenStack control infrastructure and everything here. What do you mean? Compute within local.conf. Just to be sure. Yeah, sure. 34. 33, yeah. And that's it. And so yeah. that's the list number two, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. That looks good, yeah. Okay. Let's just take a look at this here. Yep, that cleaned up. Okay, so we'll kill the controller. So, wait a sec. So, 1.3. I know, I know. That's, I don't, uh, OF type version, 1.3, so yeah. But it was for the first one. But yeah, it wasn't even calling it at all, was it? Nothing's being done. Because typically what happens is, the load comes up, uh, immediately the information goes to Newton, Newton just starts creating the bridges and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it should right away, exactly. And it did on the... Con Control mode, everything was. Oh, success? No. Okay, so I'm just restarting my open daylight uh, controller here. See the pull right away. Yeah, pull it off. Yeah, yeah. Let's see where that PM is. There's a seat on the end. So, does it, did anyone get uh, all all three things up? The Open Daylight controller, the control node for OpenStack, and the compute node. No. Okay. Let's wait till this. Okay. There we go. Okay. So this is up now. Um, let's see. Broker, broker, broker. Got it. Okay, so that's good. Okay, now I'm going to restack over here. Okay, so I'm restacking my control node at this point. Didn't I do that? Should be okay. <laughs> Couple minutes. I think so, at least in theory, right? Yeah, yeah. Restack my compute node at the same time as the control node here as well. Much better, Madhu. You knew it was going to happen during the demo, though, right? It never happened before. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so after the restarting everything, now on the compute node, we have the BR int uh, created. So, so Vinay, you were right about, you know, yeah, that, that's going to be created after the connection is, is set up between Open Daylight and Neutron. Yeah. Let's wait for my control node to, to finish the restack here.
Okay, this is almost complete. Okay, there we go. I think we're back. Let's take a look here. Yes. That looks better. Okay. Yeah, okay, so so I'm not, Madhu and I aren't quite sure what was happening there. We've not seen that, that issue before, and so, but, but we're back now to where, to where we were. Okay. Here, do you want to talk about that since you, you, you did that? Yeah, so we, we also see the, the GRE tunnel established between the two uh, compute node and controller node. Uh, and it's worth noting that those are on BRINT, separate tables, yeah, they are on, on the single bridge. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wait, is that it? No, no. no not it. Once you create, once you create the entries, you start seeing things. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. 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 So now I'm going to jump back over here. I'm going to log out of this one. Refresh this, which will force me to log in back in since I. Restarted everything. Okay, so I'll just we have all of these bridges here. There we go. Okay. Now we'll log back in over here on the OpenStack side. Yes. No, no, the, the tunnel was created. So, Madhu, we create the, the, the tunnel ports are created when the multiple nodes come up, right? Right? Yeah. So, for uh, op one three, uh, since we have just one tunnel between the nodes, we create just after the node is created, really. Because, the reason is because the DHCP, in this example, the DHCP is actually on the uh, Controller node, so anyways, any compute any computer will need uh, access to the to, to the controller, right? So we create it as soon as we get the node up. But in OpenFlow 1.0, since the tunnel resources are very critical, we create only when there's a presence of a given uh, tenant in a, on a given compute node. So 1.3, it's it's because anyways, it's going to be only one tunnel uh, per pair per pair. So across all tenants, so it's it's it's, it's okay to create it. Yeah. Right. Uh, only once. That's it. Right. Right. So one thing I'd like to highlight here is once you log into the Horizon GUI here, um, as admin, you can see if you click on the hypervisor tab, you can see uh, both both of the hypervisors show up, and this is because we're running Nova Compute on both the control node as well as the second compute node. Um, one other interesting thing that kind of was alluded to in the discussion that Madhu was just having here was was the fact that for the hydrogen release, we're actually still making use of, on the neutron side, um, of the DHCP agent and the L3 agent on the neutron side. Um, so, so those services are still running, so we're still doing all the routing through ne uh, Linux network namespaces as well on network nodes on the neutron side. Um, that's one of the things going forward that, that, you know, like a future item that we'd like to... Right to do on the open daylight side is to handle uh, certainly the L3 stuff at least on, yeah, so, on open um, daylight. So the, the way we are done uh, in, in this release is that um, once we set up the flows, open flow, open flow rules on the uh, computer and control, the controller never sees any packets at all. Since OpenStack has all the information about the VMs and you know, DCP addresses, we proactively program all the flows needed and controller is completely isolated after that, right? the open daylight controller. Um, well, we flood the R packets, we flood the DHCP, things go to place where it has to go, get resolved. So things work uh, in a demo setup, but it doesn't scale. Uh, we, we know that. So uh, our idea for the, uh, the next Helium release is to make sure we go a step further and involve more controller pieces into it, if there's a need, right? So we want to keep it flexible because we spoke to a few customers, uh, each one of them have, have different scalability issues. If you have a if, you, if everything goes to a service node, then the service node doesn't scale. If everything goes to one network node, the network node doesn't scale, right? So we are, we are getting conflicting requirements. So we kept it easy for now for the hydrogen release. It flood, 
know, and get things resolved. Uh, and we also saw an upstream uh, commit from in NovusDB no where the the local uh, open vSwitch resolves the R resolution as well, right? So uh, we we have to go towards that area where keep it local to an edge, uh, keep everything resolved on the local <coughs> node rather than being distributed to multiple devices or a single service node. So our objective is to go distribute the uh, the control to individual open switches and make it proactive as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And OpenStack is one of the best examples for uh, this uh, proactive mode because it has all the information that we need possibly, right? So, yeah. Sorry? Okay, topology alone, right? That's the exception where we leak the LNDP packets up. So if you look at the rules, you'll see, you'll see that there'll be an LNDP rule alone program there, right? So we filter out saying 0x88cc, all right? So those packets send it to the controller so that we can learn topology. But uh, practically, we don't need the topology at all. <laughs> it's mostly for the UI purposes and for the, for the applications to use that. But OpenStack itself, we don't need the topology because it's end-to-end -to -end tunnel, right? So once you know which tunnel to take, who cares about the topology, right? It's just... Right, it's one hop, put that way. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's good for the UI. If you want to see a good UI with yeah. multiple tunnels, definitely yes. I mean, that, that's when we program the LNDP alone for punting it up. Yeah. Can you show the network topology here on the horizon on the OpenStack dashboard? Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, yeah. And this is another question, right? Uh, and and this will look the same as, as if, if, if you're seeing anything else as well. So that's the admin view. Let me get in this demo here and go to topology. So it's a pretty standard, pretty standard dev stack, public private network with a router set up between the two. So, okay, so the next thing I was gonna show was actually booting some VMs on this. So then we can take a look, like Madhu alluded to earlier, some of the flows that are set up on the open vSwitch bridge and things like that as well. So um, let me quickly show this. This is in the slides that people have downloaded as well. So what we're gonna do is, um, we're going to uh, pop over to the project tab, make sure you're logged in as demo. So that's what this arrow is showing. I was trying to highlight for people new to, to Horizon what you wanna look for in this GUI, specifically for launching these VMs. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you go to the instances uh, tab down here, and then there's this launch instance button over here. And then this may look like a lot, but it's really not. It's kind of a waterfall here. You'll start with giving it a name, um, you can leave the default flavor that is selected, um, an instant count, you can give it two, it will launch two, you could launch one, launch another one later. Um, you wanna make sure you boot from image, uh, the Cirrus image will be what you select, and then you'll pop to this network tab and make sure you select that. So let me show you that uh, live as well. So we're in the demo, we're gonna go down to instances here. We're gonna go up here to launch instance. Let's call this a demo. We'll leave this at nano. We'll set two for the instance count. We'll boot uh, from image here. Um, we'll do zeros. We'll pop over here to networking and select the private network because we're logged in as the demo tenant at this point. And then we'll click uh, launch. Okay, this will take a second to, to reload here. Didn't I? Yeah, there it is. It's still. <coughs> okay, what I'm going to do is actually launch, pop over to the admin tab here. So we got the launch two instances. What I wanted to show here was if you go over to the admin tab, since we're logged in as admin, we can see where, uh, which host the VMs ended up being launched on. This is being a little bit slow, but, but you can see once we get over to this admin tab and we go to the instances here, you can see that it launched one on each of the hosts. So this VM got launched here and, and on the ODL1 and this one got launched on ODL2. So, so now if we look, if we go back over here, now if we look at, uh, where is that? Uh, that should have, wait a sec, first let's do this. Let's log in here. So we'll click on the 
the instance name, and that'll give us this instance overview. Um, for those who have not seen Horizon, this just kind of dumps everything that you set it up for, tells you the flavor, all that sort of stuff. We'll go over to the console here. Okay, so we'll scroll up. It's kind of a bizarre thing with this no VNC proxy. You have to kind of click in this gray window and then click down here. And it actually, you can actually see it tells you the, the login here. Ciros, because this is the Ciros cloud image. And um, done by a, you know, a Chicago sports fan, right? So Cubs win is the password with a smiley face at the end. Okay, so now we should be able to see in here if we do an IF config. So this particular image uh, got, got the IP address 10.0.0.3 from the DHCP server as well. So from here, if we go back, hold on, let me, if we go back here, this image got IP address 10.0.0.2. So actually, let's log into this one as well. Let me scroll this up a bit. Okay. Uh, there we go. So you can see this one got 10.0.0.2, like it said. So we should be able to, we should be able to um, ping across to the other guy, which we can. So now, one thing that's worth doing, if we look at, so that VM is actually running on ODL2. So if we're on the control node here, one thing we could actually do is we could actually look at the, at the traffic at the ping traffic, and this is of course gonna pop up my handy VMware, uh, just a sec, there we go. So you can actually see the, the encrypted, or the, the, tunneled, the tunneled ping traffic between the tenant networks going across uh, between the two hosts here as well. Mildly interesting for those of you who like ping demos done over a GRE overlay, but still. Um, we should be able to, Wait, wait a sec. Uh, let's see. We should also. Uh, oh, um, shoot! Uh, isn't that it? No, I think I'm doing this command wrong. But do what's the command to look at the flows again? That should be it. No, I'm doing something wrong, right? Yeah. Okay. Version negotiation. What? Is it? That was. Oh, dash. Oh, that's what the problem was. Yeah, yeah. I always get that messed up. Yeah, dash. Oh, there you go. Okay. A lot of flow space. A lot of. Yeah, yeah. You want me to talk over? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah, there are a lot of flows. I'll highlight okay. it here, right? So we have this controller and these are the compute here. Let's do the same command. Yeah, that's the compute, yep. Uh, dumb flows. So, so what we're gonna show here is, is all of the, the flows that are set up on the multiple tables on the BR int, because we're using OpenFlow 1.3. Yeah, so if you look at it here, right, uh, the, 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 of course the controller node will have more flows because it has uh, multiple guys talking to each other. Uh, since we use uh, OpenFlow 1.3, use only one bridge, the BR int, not BR tunnel. And uh, since, we, uh, since there's only one uh, bridge, we don't use normal forwarding at all anywhere. So every uh, floor has been hand-coded and programmed. So for example, if you have 10 VMs in a, in a given uh, compute node, you'll see at least 10 flows for doing the unicast forwarding for between them. You'll see them in, in tab table 20. So you see there are three tables here. Uh, maybe I'll filter it based on tables. It's easy to understand. A lot of flows here. Sorry, guys. There you go, right? Yeah. So uh, table zero is the default table where all traffic just comes in, in open no, 1.3. In 1.3, the way the multiple table works is tra traffic comes to table zero, and then it can get routed or get, uh, get classified and went to any other, go to any other table, but it cannot come back, right? We, we don't want to cause a loop there. So what we have done is we are using three tables, and table zero, table 10, and table 20. Table zero is the default incoming table. It classifies, and then sends to the appropriate table. Uh, I mean, the table space is a 
really uh, bigger space. So we didn't use table one and two because since we cannot come back, uh, we gave some enough space, at least 10 table spaces, in order we want to patch the things up uh, now during the release, right? So we have zero, 10, and 20. 10 does a classification, as the gentleman pointed out here. Uh, traffic coming in, so if, if you look at, let's, let's take one example here. Uh, the first one indicates that any traffic coming in with tunnel ID 2 and import 2, meaning this is com traffic is coming in from the tunnel, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, sudo OVS, VSCTL. Um, BPCTL? No. Sure? There you go. Uh, but, guys, one more thing, right? The, the DPCTL's port number is not the open floor number. <laughs> Okay, you have to be very careful here because it's easy to get. No, the open floor numbers are different, right? So if you want to know the open floor number, the best command to use is sudo obvious Translate, db client dump, right? If you do this, right, these numbers are guaranteed to be open floor numbers. So if you go up to the uh, inter the interfaces, uh, guys, one more thing, right? The DevStack OpenStack integration is not a simple one. We all know that. Uh, so Brent is one of the best bloggers that I know of, and I'm glad he's part of this project, right? So we are going to blog it out, uh, really, uh, after this release. We're going to blog, we're going to record videos, and we're going to be yeah. doing all those. So hold on till then, because we are coding till the last minute, right? <laughs> uh, so documentation comes at the end. So if you want to know the, if you want to know the, uh, the open flow number, dump the OVSDB client. Right, and then interface table has this thing, open flow port right there. No, it's in general, it's, it's open with switch, right? Uh, I don't know the reason for it, frankly, right? Uh, but the open flow number doesn't match or need not match the DPCTL number, need not. Right, the data path ports have their own yeah. IDs versus As you can see the here, open right? flow ports and vSwitch D. The o o OF port number is two here, which is the GI tunnel, right? But if you look at DPCTL, it's be different. Okay, so just just please uh, realize it's not the same. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the two we saw is is the is the tunnel t tunnel ID, and the same thing you can see it in the in this command here, right? Where traffic is coming with tunnel ID, I mean import two, and tunnel ID two, meaning this is the GI tunnels GI key that we use for the demo, etc. Right? So GI key, we are saying, okay, traffic coming in from, from this tunnel, don't send it to 10, send it to 20, table 20, right here, right? So this is one classification for a given VM, a given tenant that goes there. And uh, as you can keep seeing here, uh, traffic coming in from tunnel one, right? Send it to, again, table 20. So what we're doing is we are taking traffic from, from tunnel, sending it to table 20, meaning table 10 is going to be used for local forwarding. Table 20 is for now remote coming out and going out, right? Uh, and this one, if you look at the third, third entry here, you can see traffic coming in, in port one and DL source. So what we're doing here is uh, it's a local VM on a given node. Uh, in port one is the local tap interface, uh, which is a VM is being created. And uh, we are filtering for a given source address. So we don't want to receive multiple source, IP, source Macs on a given same tap interface, one port to one Mac. And the action is to set field. So this is where we classify. We say, you know what, the port, port one of this uh, node belongs to the tenant one, right? So we are, we are using the uh, OpenFlow 1.3's native OXM headers. There's no proprietary NXM headers here, right? Which is good because this is one. we saw multiple solutions out there. This is the only solution that we have, which is purely, purely open. This OpenFlow 1.3 with no extensions uh, OSDB assets, no extensions, right? It's, it's purely out there. If, if, you, if you implement OpenFlow 1.3 properly, right, you'll get, it, you'll get the results exactly you expect. Uh, so the action is to set field and go to table 10. And so on and so forth. You can see all the, all the flows here. Um, and you can do the uh, table 10. So table 10, of course, you'll see the local forwarding and the packets coming in from the incoming port towards the external uh, network to go inside a tunnel. So if you look, if you look at the here, you'll see most of the flows with uh, 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 output port is two. For, for example, if you look at this, this case here, we are 
We are filtering on flooding. This is the flooding interface. If you look at it, if you don't do 0x FF, FF, because any flood, we want to catch any flood, including the DHCP or you know, whatever, right? It's not, not necessarily FFFF. It could be anything starting with 0, 0.1 in the Mac. 1.3 supports Mac masking as well, right? So we use it effectively. So we, we do the real destination with 0, 0.1 and mask with 0, 0.1. So all multicast, broadcast, Macs are covered here, and all of them are sent to the tunnel, right? So we send it out. This, I was explaining about the same point where ARP, DSCP, everything is being covered by this flow, exactly this flow. And then we trade it out. Uh, when we fix the helium part, we might fix, change stuff here based on the requirements. I will give configuration requirement where eBay might want to do it differently. You guys can tweak it to make it work. So this is the, if you look at the configurations here, this is the most basic open flow rules to make DevStack work or OpenStack work out of the box. Barring all the bugs, if not you know, fixing all the issues, right? Uh, this table 10 and table 20 <coughs> is for the flows coming from the tunnel going into the network. And you can, st you can see the packet flows and everything to, if you want to trace the flow, you'll, you can trace the flow appropriately. From, from, if you do a ping, you can start seeing the flows hitting it and everything. And exactly the same on compute node and control node. Doesn't matter, it's going to be the exact same explanation for a compute node. Uh, that's it. Uh, any questions, guys, on? On the flows itself. So we typically use uh, two commands: the open flow rules and the the OBSDB rule, right? So typically things will work as is. When there's a bug, that's when we start debugging things. We go deeper inside to DPCTL, into OBSDB dumps, and going further deep inside. Yeah. Right, uh, uh, DevStack and OpenStack is a, is a great example for proactive because uh, I, can, I can show you quickly one sample, then you understand why it is so simple here. Uh, I'll do a um, OVSDB client dump, right? Uh, see, the OVSDB is just a simple protocol, right? But the reason it is much beyond a protocol is that it, it enables a lot of things like the one I want to explain right now. Uh, the libvert and the Nova's uh, piece of it on the dev stack populates the OVSDB's uh, the port interface. So if you look at the OVSDB here, I'm going to go inside the interface table. Okay, uh, what the, the 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 controller uh, what it looks for is uh, table uh, interface table. I'm mean, interface table right here. Um, there you go. This is the one, right? If you look at this, this interface, this is the most important information that you will look for in an, in a, in an OVSDB Neutron plugin. That is called, it's, it's the, uh, it is part of the external ID column, as you can see here on the interface table. So if, for nerds who wants to look at the OVSDB schema, you can see OpenVC schema has this table space, this in, interface table with external IDs there. The external ID is populated by the uh, devs, the Nova and uh, Libvirt, uh, yeah. Libvirt, Libvirt does it, gets information from uh, Nova, I guess, right, and then populates it there. And that information comes to the controller via the OVSDB channel. Now, as you can see here, the attached Mac of a given tap interface is exposed on a given OVSDB channel. So OVSDB channel dissolves to a given node, compute node, and we know exactly the location of a VM, right? So if you want to know a location of a VM, right here, the attached Mac is right there. Right? So attached Mac, whichever uh, uh, node, OSDB node gets it, that means it belongs to that particular compute node. And we resolve, if, if, if you go back again, if you, if you scroll down this one, you can see the local IP configuration here. So based on local IP configuration, we know this compute node has this tunnel endpoint. With that information, we know exactly to reach a particular attached Mac, right, on a given tenant, use this tunnel destination IP because that's, that resolves to a given node. The control knows everything. We program it source computer node. So what you do is we get the <coughs> proactively, yes. Uh, okay, that, that's, the, that's the difference, right? As I explained to you guys, for in the hydrogen release, we are doing everything proactive, right? Proactive meaning we learn it, just populate it. And the population doesn't happen blindly. 
we populate based on the presence of the tenants. So I have, say, 100 compute nodes, right? And I have a new, new tenant coming up. Uh, and there are two VMs in one, two different nodes. And only these two nodes will get the proactive flows because there's no need for these guys in any other node because there's no tenant available there, right? So we try to do some intelligence there. But of course, we can do conversation learning and so on and so forth, but it's coming later. For, for this release, it's pure proactive to kickstart the process of integration, really. Uh, and we saw it's not too much deviation. In fact, many solutions are the same, right? They don't wait for conversation learning or anything. They just program it proactively and be done with it. Open daylight. So, right, right. You're talking about the the ML2 L2 population mechanism driver, I suspect, right? Yeah, right, right. So, yeah. So, OpenStack has that. It can do that as well, and it will proactively do that. Oh, so so actually, that's okay. So, I was going to segue into this, and this was actually a good segue, right? So, so with with all of those mechanisms that you're specifically L2 population or even the open vSwitch plugin or the Linux Bridge plugin, all of those require uh, an agent on the host. So they all have an agent. They all have RPC calls going back and forth between the Neutron server and the agents. So you can imagine the scalability concerns between that, right? Um, so this approach removes that agent, and now it, we, have, we have the open daylight, uh, which is actually handling the connection to the host using OVSDB and OpenFlow as well. Um, Open Daylight is a Java application, so there's a lot of knowledge around scaling Java applications and, and that sort of thing. So, so we think this approach is a lot more scalable. And in fact, uh, one thing that, that this allows is with the current Neutron, uh, either ML2, Open vSwitch mechanism driver, or the Open vSwitch plugin, if you were to load that up and actually try to, say you just set it up with, with three hosts, two compute hosts and one control node, you try to boot 50 VMs at the same time. Um, I, you can't really do that, actually, with the Open vSwitch mechanism driver or the Open vSwitch plugin. It takes a long time. It may not even work. But with this environment, with Open Daylight, you can boot 50 VMs simultaneously, and they'll be up in a minute. It removes all that uh, RPC mechanism, all of that uh, latency and, and everything like that. So, so one thing is we're actually working with, you know, I'm actually a Neutron core member as well, and so I've been working with the Neutron folks to try to, to see how we can make this Open Daylight mechanism driver, not the default, maybe maybe eventually make it the default open source uh, plugin for Neutron as well. In other words, we're trying to get it set up into the, the gates for Tempest tests and things like that, so. Yes, question in the back. So right now, is it possible to use the mint mode uh, of the same distro uh, host, like uh, the VRM mode as well as the uh, mode, the VLAN mode? Yes, uh, so the current OSDB Neutron doesn't support VLAN yet, right? We support only GRE and VXLAN, and yes, we can support both. Yeah, yeah, in the same, in the same, uh, on the same compute nodes, we have one tenant can be in a GRE network, other tenant can be in a VXLAN network. Yes. So, so now that's actually that brings up a good point, right? We the Open Daylight mechanism driver doesn't support VLAN, and what that means is, if if you're using ML2 uh, and you create a tenant network that's type VLAN. It, um, it won't bind any VMs to the Open Daylight Mechanism driver. However, if you do need VLANs, you could run the Open vSwitch agent, the Linux Bridge, uh, uh, the Open vSwitch or Linux Bridge Mechanism driver using VLANs and bind them there, right? I mean, if you wanted. Is there any reason why VLANs would not? Uh, there's no reason. Actually, it's a lack of time, really. So, building a right. time to get the. I'm sure VLAN is the easiest one to go, but we couldn't do it. I mean, the OSDB couldn't do it, but Open DAO. Ryan is here, right? Ah, even better. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, but but to be to be honest, VP the the VTN guys implemented the VLAN stuff, right? The, if you look at the VTN plugin, uh, they have the VLAN stuff implemented. But Ryan is right. Somebody interested in VLAN contributed to this one. Please come contribute. We'll be happy to get like that. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, right, exactly. So the, the other thing is, um, oh, a question, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. How do you create, how do you map the real to the tenant having tag not to the same And also I saw that you, you create a port on VRM, you create uh, a tenant to a port, right? So if, you, if I have multiple tenants, do I create multiple ports on the VRM? Great question. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, uh, BRN, uh, tap interface are all created by, the, by uh, Libbird, 
right? So every, every uh, VM that comes along needs a tap interface. The port is being created. That, that's by default, right? And uh, let me go back and sh highlight this one, the, the mapping. Right? That's the, if you look at the end-to-end the -end picture of how the controller on Newton works, it's a very simple logic, actually. There's no complicated thing at all. In, uh, uh, I mean, the, the most complex thing is to really bring up the <laughs> dev stack environment, really. But after that, uh, I was actually uh, giving a hint last yesterday's call, yesterday's uh, conference, this meeting, right? It took us less than two months to get everything working, from zero to where we are, including 1.0 and 1.3. That's because all the information, dev stack is one of the most a valuable, rich, rich information it already has, OpenStack, right? So uh, to, to showcase the, the mapping, the question that you asked, again, this is the most important and critical piece of information that we have, right? The attached Mac is the Mac of the given VM. The interface ID here, this is the UUID of the port that is created by the Newton ports. Hey, do you have the slide? The, the big slide. Um, no, not easily. It, uh, something happened. It crashed. Sorry. All right. Um, I can't get it while you talk about it. Yeah, okay. And I'll pull it up. Right. So uh, if you look at the, the, the overall architecture, Open Daylight talks to the obvious, I mean, the OpenStack talks to Open Daylight via the Northbound APIs. The Northbound API, thanks to Ryan, Ryan contributed the Northbound API for the OVSDB Neutron. So I mean, the, sorry, Open, Open Daylight Neutron. That actually takes all the calls from the Neutron uh, Northbound APIs. And uh, on Southbound can be any of these modules working on it. So the Northbound uh, OVSDB and the OpenStack, the Open Daylight's Neutron Northbound API gets, gets all the information like the, uh, the Neutron Network, Neutron Port, and screen. Neutron Subnet. Ah, there you go. This is the one. This is going to mess with stuff, but go ahead. There you go. There you go. This is the one, right? So this is the overall architecture. I know. Didn't, uh, it's weird. OK, just get out of full screen then. There, there you go. That's fine. So this is the overall architecture. I know this is a lot of information here, but it's kind of pretty simple if I dissect it further. It's all right. It's okay. So we have this uh, Neutron with ML2 plugin right here. It talks to the uh, Open Daylight Neutron REST APIs through the REST API, uh, REST API calls. And then we have multiple uh, uh, modules here. It could be op OpenDAO, it could be OSDB, it can be BTN, it could be whoever it could be. Since the demo is on OSDB, I just highlighted only the OSDB here. No, no foul here. Uh, and the OVSDB Neutron application really talks to the AD cell interface for Open for 1.0 and MD cell interface for 1.3, uh, right? Uh, and OVSDB is still an AD cell interface, right? That's why we see a lot of uh, things on the OVS, uh, AD cell side. Uh, so uh, we use uh, any information coming from the Open switch, including the attached Mac and whatever information gets to the Southbound plugin, it goes to the Neutron application. Similarly, the Northbound APIs get the information here, right? So if you look at the, the assimilation of information, what happens is the Neutron gives the port UUIDs, the Neutron port information. The UUID that you see on the Neutron side matches, uh, it's okay. Oh. No, get, yeah, this is that weird problem I told you about. There. Yeah, okay, thanks. The, the port UUID that you see on the Neutron side will match the interface ID right here. I don't get a mouse right here, right? So the, the interface UUID here. So Can you bring up Horizon and show them that, uh, show them the port tables? Try to show them the, the Neutron network. I can go even nerdier. You want to do that? <laughs> Let's do a nerdier one. I like to be a nerdy one. All right. I can do a dumper default Airborne. Neutron ports. <laughs> There you go, right? Yeah, so if you look at the, the controller has all the information, of course, right? The rise is much greater than the uh, It's dirtier. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Right? So, yeah, go on. Yeah, so, so basically, we'll take the first line of the neutron port that you guys can highlight. Oh, yeah, you want to highlight um, that up there? Yeah. Basically, you've got the port. This, yeah. is, this is a dump of what you find. Here, Ryan, here. Why is the phone uh, this is a port of, This is a dump of what you find in the... Uh, in the neutron, in the uh, uh, neutron interface for ports, but also inside the, an infinite span cache in the controller. Um, port UUID <laughs> is assigned by neutron. Um, the neutron network is part of is the network UUID, so you can dump that to find out about it. Um, uh, we haven't given a name. I don't know why you guys didn't. Uh, 
whether it's up or not, is the admin state true? Uh, MAC address is the, the part we were talking about, what's the, the MAC address attached to it? And then what the IP address of it is? Uh, You're going to be here. Oddly enough, you guys know something rather interesting with that. Um, yeah, the fixed IP. Oh, all right. We don't, you don't, we be don't, here. It's, it's we don't see reference it. Okay. Yeah. This is actually in the spec. If you look in the neutron spec, when you get the fixed IP, it's an actual structure. It points to a subnet, UUID, and gives you an address out of that cider block that you're actually using. So if we went and looked, we'd see that it's either 10002 or 10003. I don't remember which one it is. Right. right. And then last but not least, uh, device. Uh, what device owns this port? In this case, uh, we set it up for a router gateway. And then um, this one doesn't have a tenant because it's on a router, but if you drop down to the next one, you've got a tenant ID, and that's also set up by Neutron. Oh, actually, it comes to Neutron from um, eastbound. So that's how that gets plugged in. So once you have the information from the northbound, and you saw the OSDB giving us from southbound, right? The given tap interface has a interface ID. We map with this port ID here. This is our UUID, right? Universally unique identifier. So looking at that port ID mapping, we know which tenant it belongs to. Once I know which tenant it belongs to, I can look at the network ID and go to the GRE key, and voila, we have all the information we need, and do the pre -pro I mean, proactive forward. Pro pro so. so there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the ports that is here. Yep, yeah. So it's hey, pretty one? simple if you ask me. If you look at the, the, if you look at the, the beauty of this open data architecture, I, I like it because of the OSGI, the way it is done. So anybody can build their module. Like for example, Ryan built it on its own time. I built my own OSDB. We all put together and we didn't even interact really, right? He has these interfaces defined. All right, Ryan goes to sleep. I look at the interface. All right, I I I implement them, uh, and that's it. It's it's like really a magic come true. In fact. Ryan wrote the Northbound module. In fact, we never interacted when we integrated. Really, he was surprised. What do do? Why didn't you even talk to me? Because we don't have to, right? That's that's the beauty of OSGI, really. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, yeah. I'll do the dance again. Um. <laughs> Right. We all know, right, this is the tap interface. It doesn't show much, right? Um, what really shows a lot of information is the OSDB dump client, right? If you do OSDB dump, uh, client dump, it shows all the information you need from an open vSwitch perspective. Uh, so the, the OSDB channel is a bidirectional JSON RPC. It's, it's very critical because the, the controller, the OSDB plugin, uh, keeps listening to what is happening on the OSDB switch, whether we program it or somebody else programs it. So that's, that's the reason when, when the libvirt programs this interface table with this information of attached Mac, we keep listening to it and we get the information because we do the OSDB monitor, so we monitor and get the information. So the tap interface, which also has the open flow port number, right, uh, and it has the external ID column with attached Mac interface ID, we use this information, so if you look at the, v, we don't use the VMID per se because we don't, we can get it from anywhere, it's not information. The attached Mac and interface ID are used. The interface ID is the port ID that you see on the Neutron port, right? So whatever you see in the Neutron port here, which you got from the not born from the Neutron side, we map these two together. So once, from my interface ID, we get to the port ID. From the port, you can go to the tenant and the network, right? Once you go to the network, we know whether it's GRE or VXLAN. Once the network is going to give us what is the key, GRE key or VXLAN key, right? So we use all segmentation IDs from there. We, it's like a chain. It's like a really linked chain. If you look at the uh, open stack, all these Neutron network, Neutron subnet, Neutron ports, Neutron routers, and whatever, right? They are like a chain, link links of uh, UIDs. So you can take one UID, you can traverse anywhere you want to, really, right? So all you need is the, the hint that you get from the OSDBs uh, the uh, external ID column. So the OVSDB Neutron application sitting on top keeps listening to all this important information. So if you look at the code, if you look at the Neutron code, you'll see that it, OVSDB Neutron is an application, really. The, it use, makes use of the basic infrastructure that we already developed called the OVSDB plugin and OVSDB libraries. It's, that's, that's the two bundles which is running on the base controller. So the only difference on the virtualization edition is we added this application which listens to whatever the, the base 
thing gives, and we'll, we listen to only what we are interested in. We are interested in statistics yet, so you'll see the code to remove all stats updates. We look only for this update, and then do the... But, but, but the, key, the key is there's only one tunnel between them, right? And we're doing the flows, right? One tunnel per... One tu one not tunnel doing... Per node. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's okay. how OS... Let me go to this next thing. That's how OS, OES DB does it. Right, VTN yeah. does it different. VDN has no tunnels, actually. They have VLAN stuff. does it different as well. Um, Just wait, I'm going to go to that. Hold on. One thing... Apologies for jumping in here. I'm okay, gonna okay. Gonna still, and now I am going to still like... Um, one thing that I wanted to point out, the... <laughs> Just because you have the, the Neutron application and bundles in the controller, you don't need OpenStack on the top to actually configure this stuff. If you want to write your own REST client or just make straight REST requests, you can do that. Um, when I do the OpenDove tutorial in a couple of hours down at the other end, um, I'm not going to be running OpenStack on top of it. I'm going to be doing raw REST requests in You're a smart in, guy. You're a very smart it, guy. In to <laughs> configure everything. <laughs> No, I'm lazy. <laughs> you are smart. Hey, uh, it's, it's a very good point. Yeah. Even though we call it a neutron outbound API, yeah. the gentleman named Hugo from the CloudStack, he has already implemented CloudStack with this one, meaning he doesn't care whether it's called neutron because end of the day it's a REST API, right? So he wrote a plugin on CloudStack. It calls the exact same APIs, and now we are glad to announce CloudStack also works with, uh, with OpenDaylight. And, and, and the best part is, those actually are real Neutron APIs, so the CloudStack guys are using the Neutron <laughs> APIs too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, we create the full mesh channels only with the location, if the location is appropriate, right? We don't do uh, conversational learning, right? We don't want to learn and then program, right? As I said, this is the first cut. Make it work. At this point, it's proactive, meaning we don't want to wait for the traffic to begin to start flowing, right? So we, we learn the location, and it's only one tunnel, right? It's not a big deal, one tunnel. But the, the real thing which we need to really improve there is the, is the flow program, <laughs> because we kind of Program all the, the the once we learn a VM, we program the task mac on all the uh, node which is participating in this, in this tenant. We do it right. So yes, flow will be a lot of flows, but you are guaranteed it's going to work because it's all pre-programmed, right? Uh, yeah, that those are the improvements that we and you who are going to participate and who has complaints about a lot of flows, <laughs> come and help us fix the issue. Conversational learning. Let's do it. I mean, let's let's do it. Yeah. But this is just an entry into the into the world of you no know, uh, integration, really. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think, so. uh, I think I think that I mean, unless there's questions, I mean, I think that's about it, right? Yeah, that's about it. Does anyone have any final questions or? Uh, uh, yeah. We are, we all hang out in the open daylight iPhone OVSDB IRC channel, yeah. and we don't send a lot of emails really because we don't have the patience to send emails. So we all there chat, 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 and get things done. Uh, so send emails to OSDB Dev, and we'll point you back to the IRC channel. So please come to IRC and let's hang out, and it's really fun, more fun there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, thanks everyone. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.